which is the insurance component. So the way we had originally conceptualized it was MediShield kicks in when the cost becomes catastrophic. So you start off with your uh, savings scheme, which can be pulled within the family for acute illnesses, but nobody can tell you whether the acute illness will become catastrophic or chronic. And that's when MediShield is supposed to provide insurance, the insurance backing. And that was the plan. But over the years, as you can see, we allow people to opt out of MediShield. Right? And when you start having a high opt-out rate, guess what will happen? You end up with adverse selection. And so five years ago, the, the then Minister for Health closed it up by making it almost compulsory to say that if you want to opt out, you still got to pay into the basic MediShield. So now we allow people to also buy the so-called MediShield Plus, which is now called Integrated Shield Plans. And they keep changing the names because now many of the insurance companies are rushing in now to supplement our basic MediShield because the ba basic MediShield is not enough. It's, only it's supposed to cater only for the subsidized wards. Right? If you want private wards and all that, you have to buy supplementary insurance. But now we have created another moral hazard because there's so much private insurance now, the so-called integrated shield plans, which is essentially uh, supposed to be the MediShield Plus in the, in the old days. Now what happens if you don't have MediSafe and therefore the premiums into your MediShield that will come from MediSafe every month if you don't opt out, you know, you're in. Now, what happens if you don't have MediSafe? That means you also don't have insurance. Now, for, for the small numbers that don't have it, originally we said, well, we created a third M, which is the MediFund, which is to pay for the indigent, the poor. Right? So the first year of uh, the introduction of uh, MediShield, we find that about 12% of people opted out. And most of them were old people who could not even afford the, the premiums. And so MediFund comes in to help them if you uh, happen to uh, run out of money and you don't have a family member who's got a MediSafe account. So, so those are very, very stringent criteria. Uh, it's not like the welfare schemes where everybody automatically qualifies. So when you don't have enough MediSafe and therefore you don't have MediShield, MediFund is supposed to kick in. Now on paper, that's what is supposed to work. The 3M was supposed to be there as a universal health plan to make sure that every Singaporean is not denied the care. But along the way, we find that the way it is implemented, you've got little short uh, gaps here and there. The, Medi the MediSafe limits, the payout, always lag behind the real cost of healthcare. Very naturally so, because inflation, you know, healthcare is very labor intensive as well as capital intensive. You've got to pay for all the latest drugs and uh, procedures and so on. You've got to pay for highly trained staff. So the inflation will always be a hit of the um, limits that have been set by insurance or by uh, government 3M. Now, what do you do about healthcare that's provided outside the hospital, the institutions? If you look at the 3M, it is actually designed to really cater for the cost of medical care that is controlled within the hospital setting. But then it creates a sort of a perverse incentive for people to then hospitalize, you know, even for social reasons. Now, to do that, to prevent this uh, adverse selection into institution, you have to then create financing uh, for the out-of-hospital care, for the step-down care. Right? So that's where elder shield is supposed to come in. What happens if you have an old folk who has got chronic uh, illness, um, who would have been uh, treated in the hospital where it is adequately paid for by the three M's, but if you don't have the incentive to discharge this person back to their home, and you don't have uh, money to pay for chronic care on a long-term basis, you know, like uh, home nursing and home-based care and so on, then they will end up in the hospitals, right? So Elder Shield was created essentially um, for this purpose, which is to provide for the kind of long-term care. Now, you, you think about MediShield and Elder Shield, they're basically insurance plan to take care of high cost of care, whether it's catastrophic illness or it's chronic care. But the problem again with Elder Shield is that when it was designed, the opt-out rate was 40%. Now, to, to my mind, as a public policy person, this is probably a public policy failure. 40% opted out. Any public insurance program should ideally should be compulsory. So you get the maximum benefits and they've got you get some cross 
subsidy in terms of the big risk pool. You know, if everybody puts the premium into a big insurance pool, then there's a lot of money to get uh, to, to, to go around for everyone. But if everybody selfishly say, I'm not going to put my money in, right? Then the pool gets smaller. So Elder Shield, to my mind, is right, right now the biggest uh, problem now in our current healthcare financing. Who's going to pay for this growing number of old people to take care of them in nursing homes and in, uh, in the community, in their own homes, right? So we do all sorts of little uh, interim gaps to fill in, but it doesn't seem to be enough. So I think it is about time that we take a very comprehensive overview you know, and to, to, to overhaul this whole system. So this system is really based on uh, a mix of the different strategies. So we start to shift away from uh, a predominantly taxation system towards um, insurance, where insurance works only to for the truly insurable catastrophic events. Uh, then for savings, we want to bring it in so that people were safe in the young and productive age and they were safe as they live longer and longer. You know, so there's enough across the generations. And you don't wait till you're old and you expect the next generation of taxpayers to pay the, the premiums or, or taxes, which is just not enough. So the savings part is meant for ageing. Then last but not least, we still say the family and the personal responsibility to, get, uh, to be there. So this is supposed to be the balance. So my take on this is that the Singapore system, which is, uh, well, again, this is my conceptualization, have to be balanced so that we strengthen all the different safety nets, the 3M. You probably have to, well, I think we have safe enough or over safe, but your MediShield is rather weak. The insurance part is rather weak. And we can jolly well tweak the rules to say more of the savings should be converted and be put into the big risk pool. So there's more to go around to pay for catastrophic illness. And, and then to strengthen the part uh, for long-term care, the elder shield part has to be made compulsory as well. So otherwise, the pressure as the, as the base of the pyramid, the tip of the pyramid widens. With more and more people getting catastrophic and acute care, we need to strengthen the different safety nets. So otherwise, the pressure will be on government to provide the public subsidies. And uh, where is the money going to come from in the future from an aged population? So thank you very much. I will stop here and then leave it to the rest to debate this. Um, thank you very much, Kai Hong. Um, the second speaker, Dr. Jeremy Lim. Um, Dr. Lim is the principal consultant of Insights Health Associates. He's also the chair of the steering committee of the NUS initiative to improve health in Asia. Um, Jeremy, please. Thank you. Testing, testing. Well, I must thank all of you. Frankly, I was amazed when really Prof Koch said there were going to be over 200 of you. I thought, my God, don't you guys have better things to do? <laughs> I, then your master tells me it's part of a compulsory module on really biomedicine. So for those of you who are not Singaporean, welcome to Singapore. <laughs> okay. um, I'm afraid sitting next to Paul has made me feel somewhat rebellious. So I will, so I will present a slightly different perspective. And, and, in, the, and in the dinner prior to this talk, uh, uh, really, Professor Ko has plied me with very generous amounts of very good alcohol. So, um, so really, forgive me if I say things that I really shouldn't. <laughs> so, what I would like to do today, and this is the slide to qualify that the WHO in the year 2000 rated Singapore the sixth best health system in the world. Uh, two things we should take note. Firstly, that the WHO has never done a similar ranking ever since. Um, and Professor Cole will basically share with you that the Americans were ranked 33rd. And since the Americans contribute more than half the budget to the WHO, it's not terribly sensible to keep repeating this. So the WHO has never subsequently done a ranking. The second thing that's pertinent is that if you look at the charts, we do very, very well in the efficiency, the levels of health and so on. But where Singapore gets whacked is in the financial fairness. And that's actually something that many countries have criticised the Singapore model, that, that the financial burden is far too onerous. 
And that's actually why I've taken this year off to write a book on the Singapore health system because there's tremendous interest from a public policy point of view, from an intellectual point of view. There are actually two big questions that many government